Welcome and thank you for taking the time with us this afternoon. In the spirit of reconciliation, Blind Sports Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Hi, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Matt Clayton and I'm the CEO here at Blind Sports Australia. Joining me today are my colleagues, Felicity Wilkerson and Christopher Woodruff. And the three of us will, will facilitate today's session. For those of us who don't know Blind Sports Australia, we're the national sporting organisation for blind and vision impaired sport in Australia. We help to create pathways and opportunities for blind sports participation from grassroots community level right up to elite competition at national and international level. We do this by working with our amazing members and other organisations across Australia to grow those opportunities for people who are blind or have low vision. About 12 months ago, we began working with the Bells as our BSA ambassadors in a new program that we hoped would be a mutually beneficial partnership for the members of the Bells team and also for us here at BSA. Over that time, we really enjoyed the opportunity of working with this amazing team of high performance athletes and sharing a part of their journey as well as supporting them in a range of ways along the road to Tokyo. We look forward to working with them post games in their continuing role as, B, as BSA ambassadors. Now, before we begin, I also wanna recognize that today is IBSA World Goalball Day and the 75th anniversary of the sport of goalball. And we couldn't think of a better way to celebrate that than by spending a bit of time having a relaxing chat with the team about their experiences in Tokyo. Not that I need any introduction, but joining us today, of course, are members of the Aussie Bells team. Mika Horsburgh, Jenny Blow, Tian Taylor, Rysa Martin, Brody Smith, and Amy Ridley. And of course, their coaches, Peter Kaur and Simon Smith. Now to kick things off, I'm gonna start with a few questions and I'll also pass on to Felicity and Krista to ask a few as well. But I might start with, um, I might start with Brody. It's a bit of a loaded question, this one, but the first question I have is, what was your favourite thing in the village? Um, well, personally, my favourite thing um, about, about the village was I really enjoyed, uh, there was an, a huge Ajitos at the uh, end of the, the flag pathway, uh, which was really, really cool. Uh, so my highlight was definitely seeing that and just seeing the, the sunset and the community spirit of the Australian mob in that environment. It was it like sure it was a COVID impacted Olympics, but it was still such an incredible experience. And um, the just just the way the whole the whole village worked was just even with the restrictions we had on it was um, yeah it was truly exciting. But definitely the Ajidos. And for those of you who don't know what the Ajidos is, it's the three swirls of color that represent the Paralympic Games. So there's the red, green, and blue swirl, and they represent the spirit of motion that is present within. Uh, Paralympic athletes playing sport and so it was really cool to to just be in a Paralympic village and I think seeing that definitely cemented that for me. Awesome what about it? some of the some of the other girls? I'll, I'll add in there oh, if, yeah um, one of my highlights for those who didn't pick up is the my mad bunch decided the day after competition or two days after competition that um they weren't going to restrict themselves to their room. So they actually met at the, uh, exactly where Brody said and decided they'd do a half marathon together. So uh, that's the sort of nutty bunch I'm, I'm dealing with. I was going to ask about that one a bit later on. I was, I was super impressed when I saw that. Although I did hear that you didn't quite make it, but you may have had a bit of a uh, incident beforehand. Uh, I did have an incident beforehand, but I, I Receive very little sympathy because uh, if I can't handle wet stairs from the eleventh floor, that's all on me. <laughs> that's that. Excellent. Anyone else have some some uh, favourite parts in the village? Um. Oh, sorry. You go. Oh, I was just going to elaborate what Brody said about the um the mob and the the Australian team spirit. For us who who've gone to another Paralympic Games, obviously there's lots of bells and whistles that weren't here this Paralympic Games. But the one thing that was the best this, this Paralympic Games compared to other Paralympic Games was the entire Australian team. Uh, we got to know so many different athletes. Uh, when we came back from Games, win or lose, it, people knew, people watched us and 
people had words of encouragement and celebrations and yeah that team spirit was incredible this time around yeah, awesome rice what were you gonna say um, it was very similar to what Jenny said, and that mob spirit was so strong um, within the Australian um, team. But what I was going to say is that uh, the other thing that I really enjoyed was the fact that we had a space outside our building where we had tables and benches and we could just sit down and eat our meals together as teams and really, you know, talk about our days and talk to other team members like outside of the bells. And that was just something um, that I definitely, um, you can't replace that. Um, so if you have to replace the dining hall, that was probably my favourite thing about the village. Like the fact that we were able to, to do that and have that space together to share, um, win, lose or draw and have that experience. It was amazing. Yeah, awesome. I, I, now, it's a bit of a lighter question this one because I saw a lot of videos, um, both of the Olympics and the Paralympics, and I'm pretty sure I saw one of the members of this team highlight the vending machine and, and uh, the free vending machines throughout the event. So the fact that you could use your uh, your pass to be able to get use the vending machine for for water and things like that. Yeah, I I didn't know that that was a thing. I was like I was so excited when I found out because I I got like a little Coca Cola like key ring in my in my pack and I was with Tian and I was like what does this do? And she's like oh yeah you get free drinks and I was like what? And so um, then like we went. This is the best free drinks all day, every day. It was, yeah, highlight, definitely. Yeah, and the look on Brody's face when she realised that this little uh, device, when held up to a machine, would give her a free Coke. Um, I was and our girls must have been pretty damn good at it because on the last uh, two days in the village, they actually ran out of Coke anywhere in the village. So other than Simon and myself who'd managed to stash some away um there wasn't sure. there wasn't any coke because of these things what are you gonna say Mika? yeah i'm gonna add to that i was just before pete actually did say um about us drinking the coke by the time that we actually wanted a coke um because we well i know i didn't drink any during the competition uh by the time we wanted it it was gone pretty sure Simon and Pete drunk at all. I second that. I second I that. Yeah. that. <laughs> Definitely Pete and Simo were the coat quarters. Yeah. And <laughs> it was all gone. I don't mean to throw Simo under the bus, but I ran a sorry <laughs> second to him. I and, I, and I will I will just highlight that during um the half marathon, Amy and myself um didn't participate, but we definitely um were very supportive of Pete walking to the other side pretty much of the village to go get some cokes and bring them back as well as water and power right but yeah i think um you know the free the free stuff you get in the village despite myself being at three um still gets me there was a grab and go um what they call grab and go stations and um us girls went there and had like energy bars and everything and they set it up like a little shop like a little canteen and i still you know i've been I've been to two now. I know that stuff is free, but it's still, you know, you line up and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll have one of those. And I still have that awkward pause, like waiting for her to be like, oh, that's $4.50. But they never <laughs> say it. So it always, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you go, you're still like, what? This is crazy. <laughs> and to give people a bit of an idea, Matt, um, I mean, someone mentioned about us not being able to get to the uh, dining hall, which sounds like a real negative, but can I assure you that uh, I think it probably saved us as a team and everybody on the Australian team probably an hour and a half, two hours a day, which um, we could spend rather than lining up in a dining hall, um, we could just duck downstairs. And, and whilst it, the food always gets a little bit repetitive, the Australian team did a fantastic job of um, trying to keep us healthy and uh, feed us at the bottom of our apartment. So it was a really cool environment to be in yeah fantastic fantastic please do handball next question to you okay so i've got the question that i don't really know who to direct it to i just like everybody perhaps to chip in it was a um a real roller coaster of games and it was real i know from my house it was really tense at our end but i can only imagine how it was for for the team and I guess it was just to get your perspective on on how you felt riding that roller coaster from the first match 
through to, um, you know, getting through to the quarterfinals? What were some of those emotions that you went through? Um, so maybe I'll ask Bryce perhaps to start off and then everyone else to jump in. Um, I think I found it very difficult to actually feel some of those emotions. Um, a lot of it came down to having to, you know, finish a game and reset for the next game. So when we won our game against Canada, like that was an amazing, amazing feeling. And like, I, I, I think we struggled to even um, celebrate that because we were then focused on the next game. So we made up for it once we, you know, beat Russia. And that was a really, I think we, we really felt that and celebrated that. Um, but it was, it was difficult to actually like, uh, sometimes express those feelings and 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 um even now I'm still trying to figure out how I felt throughout that whole phase so I hope that makes sense yeah for sure <clears throat> what about um for the uh, players that were new to the Paralympics Brody and and Amy that must have been just something undescribable yeah well um playing on such a huge um huge scale event in itself comes with a lot of emotions um and then to play and compete the way that we did um I'm I'm so unbelievably proud of everyone on this team and um we had highs we had lows but uh we did it together and yeah looking back on the experience I oh I I I, I get slightly emotional thinking about it because um it, it was a lot of hard effort and work to get to where we got to and everyone gave it their all. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm really proud of everyone. And the experience in itself was just, yeah. I um, was super excited. Everyone can tell everyone on this team knows how excited I was. <laughs> I told them regularly. Um, game time. Game time. So uh, yeah, it was really an exciting and humbling experience. Yeah, I think bouncing off that, you had both sides of the emotions. I think you had your individual emotions, but then you had like the group emotions, the team emotions. Um, and sometimes, like a lot of the time they were together and occasionally they were in conflict. But um, I think the first time, I remember saying it um, in a media interview, the first time I went on court, I thought I was going to be so nervous. Um, but the level of excitement was insane. I Like if I'd reflected two weeks before and go, what would I feel like um, sitting in a game, sitting side of court, being on the court, what would I feel like? I'd probably say I'd be really stressed. But as Brody said, the level of excitement was amazing. Um, but yeah, in terms of the team, I said it once in a team meeting, um, when I'm on the side of court, I actually keep myself patched because I can't see enough to see the game. So it's actually more distracting <laughs> if I have my patch off. Um, I drove whoever was next to me on the bench insane asking questions. Um, but I feel like having no sight at all and experiencing the game and listening to the game and listening to my team communicate on the court or being on the court and talking with them. I feel like that makes you feel the emotions so much more when you don't have the vision going on at the same time. Um, so I thought that was really amazing. And to feel everything together as a team, all of the emotions, all the highs and all the lows, that's like something you can't replicate in normal life. That's a Paralympic thing and that's pretty cool. Oh, fantastic. It certainly came across like that um, from the little glimpses that we got on the TV. I saw that you had a uh, firm hold of the kookaburra. What was its name? Yeah, the kookaburra was called Karen. She was good stress relief. I think I nearly squeezed her feet off a few times, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's terrific. And I think we've got a couple more questions. Um, certainly, we'll, we'll definitely come back to all of those feelings because it's really great to hear um, hear how it was and, and sort of get a little bit of a glimpse into what it must have been like. Um, Krista, did you have something for the team? Could, could I just jump in there? Sorry, Felicity. Um, to just give credit to these girls. At the very beginning, we get out there. We haven't played for over two years and, and we get out there on this amazing court and, in an amazing environment. And these girls made a decision led by the senior girls, led by Mika in particular, but all the senior girls had been, and they made a decision that from the time we got on the bus till the time they finished recovery, which is about anything between a two and a half and a three hour period, that was team time. That was our time together. And whatever we were going to feel, 
um, we were going to do that together. If it was disappointment, then we were going to feel it and we were going to express it together. If it was elation, we were going to feel it. And before anyone else could understand, we were there together and, and we were going to stay there together. And that was an initiative which I would absolutely recommend to any team going away that what you experience as a team is, is sacred to that team and for those girls to drive that and that was part of the success because we were really disappointed but we went through the disappointments together after the first game and I think that formed the, the basis to feel so good later on in the tournament. Yeah, fantastic. The great um, mantra. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, it's brilliant and excited to see you all um, again. Um, I have a bit of a different question. Um, just in relation to the lead up to the games, um, you know, there's people that are probably um, on this call that, you know, know a little bit about um, how the Bells um, sort of were able to, to get into training and with all the trials and tribulations of, of COVID and all of those things. But um, if you girls and, and the coaches could just put it into a bit of perspective as to the lead up to the Paralympic Games and just how unbelievably um, exciting it is that that you were able to come together and um, and represent your country um, as well as you did with um, what's going on in the world at the moment. Yeah, well, I mean, the effects of COVID has, you know, is it's impacted everyone. Um, you know, every everyone's life has been impacted by some extent from COVID, and I guess putting on a Paralympics, you know, adds a huge level to that. Um, I know that you know us bells, like we took into Tokyo, we're going to do everything together. And I think um, COVID was probably a bit of a blessing for us because even though we couldn't train together and we went from, you know, we play a team sport and because of border closures and all that stuff, we had to train individually, um, which is quite difficult when you sign up for a team sport. I know I found that difficult. Um, so, you know, we had to shift some of our goals individually um, so we could, you know, perform our best for when our team got together. But I think as well for us, um, it gave us the chance to work on as well our communication off court, um, you know, which I think for me is just as important as what it is on court. Um, so I think COVID helped us in, in, that, um, in that aspect. But yeah, I, I guess, you know, <laughs> a few of us have, you know, we've been new penciled in a camp was gonna be on this date and, you know, even two days out, even one day out, we still didn't know if it was gonna happen or not. And, you know, some of us, well, I got stuck in Queensland for an extra week because I was trying to dodge borders and red zones and all that type of stuff. So um, yeah, it, it, it has impacted us a lot, but I think, you know, what, what Pete said before and what our mantra is together, I think even though we couldn't physically be together and by the time Tokyo came around, I think we were ready to be together. Um, I think we put in a lot of effort outside, off court, to make sure that not only were we training and still keeping each other and ourselves motivated, but still keeping the team, um, you know, the team's goals still there and still working together as best as we could as a team, even though we physically weren't in the same space all the time. If Simon was answering this, he'd put a thumbs up to what you all of you, um, and the team will understand that better than anyone. Um, uh, Tian's selling a number of the things short. These girls have gone through eight weeks of 100% isolated commitment, and that includes Amy and Tian moving to Maitland uh, in an Airbnb so that they could escape when the, the Sydney breakout came out. They lived in isolation there except for training. Then COVID got to Maitland, so Simon had to move out of his house because he became a, um, a secondary close contact and couldn't attend training. Um, Andrew, I, th I think, is on the call. Andrew Ridley, who I think is on the call. Thank you, Andrew. He took over training at that point in time. We have really elite athletes who like order and organisation and want advanced things. I know how important that is to Miku, who did such a good job. She 
found a way to be strong and adapt to changes which could um, be completely turned on their head in a day. And for her to manage her work commitments and make herself available to get almost at the drop of a hat where we needed to be. But for eight weeks, we've been basically isolated from real life just to get ourselves to Melbourne um, so that we could get to Tokyo. And to, now we've got to get through this and then we'll get back to our, the people we love, I suppose. Pete, even on that, I, I remember there was one session where we thought we'd have we had everybody in, and then um, I think Brisbane ended up being going into becoming a red zone at one point. And I remember that uh, that all of a sudden that Rice and Mika had to um, isolate away for a little bit. But even even there, that the adaption to while the rest of the team were there on site and training um, and had to separate, still engaged in that whole process. Um, sure. And I remember seeing images of certainly and I can I can picture Mika in my head of of you with a, with a mask, but still be able to engage with the team. And Ross, you would have been there as well around what they were doing on court. And I think you had some of the Victorian boys come along um, and do some of the training as well as that. So when you talk about the fact that things changed so quickly, it really was, even when you're in one place, that changed. And that so much of that um, adaption by everyone along the way, I know for me, sort of being on the fringe of it was uh i i was emotional about it because i was writing writing that sort of on the outside it's i can only imagine what it would have been like for all of you inside that bubble i think the thing that that we've gained throughout this whole process is the ability to actually you know change things on the fly but what that's done is build the resilience that we needed to actually cope and and actually thrive in the games environment so I, I don't know, I'm, I'm looking at it as a glass half full. I know it's been absolutely chaotic and nightmarish, but in some respects, what it's done is actually prepare us for, for the unexpected and, and the inevitable highs and lows. So if you can handle all of those stressful events, then, you know, the Paralympics becomes less daunting and less stressful because you can just get through and get on it and do what you need to do. So I think that's one thing we've gained throughout this whole 18 months and as, as hard as it's been we've worked together to actually overcome that and I'm really proud of the girls and, and like for us to work together like that I just think that's been incredible yeah absolutely absolutely um yeah as I said I think that captures it so well uh, and, and I think certainly from outsiders looking on into uh, Tokyo the fact that you were able to adapt um so much while you were there was, was really evident and so it didn't surprise me at all for the journey you've all been on over the last, well, I'll say 18 months, but it's obviously been longer than that as well. But yeah. certainly the pinnacle of what the last 18 months has been, um, that adaptation was certainly, we could see that from our perspective from Tokyo. So um, yeah, amazing. What I might do is I might move us along to the next question that I've got down here, just as conscious of time. So one thing that I know I've had a few people ask me is, did you have much interaction with other athletes from Australia or from different countries while you were at the Games? I might ask that one to Amy. I might start with you. Yeah, um, we had a lot of contact within the Australian mob. So yeah. everybody in the Australia allotment was allowed to communicate so long as as per the rules for Australia and the IPC, you're wearing a mask pretty much anywhere other than when you were sleeping. Um, so all contact was done with the mask on, which was okay. It was tricky for those of us who are vision impaired because it's really hard to identify people when they have a mask on. Um, but we do well. Yeah, it was amazing to meet so many Australian athletes, people with so many stories, very different stories, diverse backgrounds, and not just I guess their performance, but the way that they could push their bodies and be athletes was really inspiring. Um, in terms of an international perspective, we didn't have a lot of contact with athletes from other countries. I think the only contact I really had was through the pin swap initiative. So all of the Australians were given pins, which had little things on them. Some of them um, this year were Tokyo, well, Japan themed, but with Australia on them. So koalas with like in sumo suits and those sort of things. They were quite funny. Um, you could trade them with other countries. So it was relatively fleeting, I guess, the interaction you did get to have with other countries. But it was also nice just to 
feel the atmosphere, I guess, of everybody, again, feeling those emotions and soaking in that experience of the Paralympic Games. Yeah, awesome. What about some 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 else from the team? Um, now, Mika, I know you've got a lot of friends around the globe, around goalball. Did you ha have a chance? And probably it would have been difficult to interact with any of them over there. Um, I had a couple of chances to. I caught up with um, a couple of the Belgian men's team. Um, obviously, kept two meters apart and had a mask on and outdoors. We we're never allowed indoors with other people. Um, but that was just like a quick hello, how's it going, good luck, you know, things like that. And then had a quick chance to say goodbye because um, they had a rule that um, within 48 hours of you finishing competing, you had to uh, leave the village. So that was a very quick, oh, we're leaving tomorrow, see you later. <laughs> so um, unfortunately, yeah, I, I mean, the games are really good because you do get to meet a lot of people and we didn't have that this time. So that was a bit disappointing, but um, I've been lucky enough to have that my career to be able to meet them and um, hopefully stay in contact um, throughout the years. So, Yeah, fantastic. Was there any, anyone that you, that you, that you met within the Australian mob that's um, you do a bigger fan, fan girling on? Pete, I'm talking, including you here or Simon? Oh, I'll answer that. I just, I, there's a, f um, a few people I like to follow, but I just started following um, Curtis McGrath and I've, he's been doing a few things within um, quarantine and I commented on one of them today and then he wrote back to me and now he follows me. So I'm really happy about that. And we had a good conversation. So <laughs> silly, but I was excited. <laughs> He's awesome. Anyone else? One, one of the difficult things that Amy alluded to was the fact that, uh, you know, I know people back in Melbourne say about this mask stuff, but that's the stuff that's going to keep people largely safe and we were pretty committed to that except for when we were in our very own tight-knit environment and it was really difficult when you are with a group and you've followed everyone and you've met all these new faces but you only really recognize them from their eyes yep. um so then when we get to trying to do karaoke on the last night and, and these people take their masks off um you're sort of almost reintroducing yourselves to people who you've been spending all this time with um, they might have been your medical people or physios or whatever, but you recognise them with a mask on and you don't recognise them with a mask off and it takes you that split second to, to readjust. But, I mean, the whole group, you know, the fact that people took such a great interest and even the, the, the administrative staff, um, the amount of work they did to, to make sure that we got there and, and it's just unbelievable. So you've, you've made lots of little contacts and there's... Make, she's better on social media than what I am. I'm a dud, but um, but I, I wouldn't know what following means. That means I'm, I've been following her around. I get into trouble for that. Thanks, Pete. Simon, I want to hear from you. You stole my thunder. That was what I was going to say about mask wearing. Was like there was there was people that I didn't recognise when they they took their mask off. For sure. I suppose the other interaction we did have is with the volunteers at the goalball court. Um, quite often they would be, it'd be the same people taking us to the buses and taking us to the change rooms. And you build a bit of a relationship with them and they uh, they wave every time. Uh, a thing that happens towards the end when we were like walking in and out of the venue, as, as soon as you leave the venue, even if you weren't playing, like as soon as you leave the venue, they start clapping and just like the whole way around from the venue to the, the change room, all the Japanese volunteers are just clapping, uh, applauding you for your efforts. Even, even if all you were doing was walking from the, uh, from watching a, a game, <laughs> it was pretty funny. Or picking up a coat. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thanks team. Uh, Felicity, I might hand over to you for the next one. 
Sorry, playing with the mute button. Um, thanks, Matt. While you were just talking about the opportunities for interaction and, and what were some of the things that you got up to, and the question that jumped into my head, which is actually down um, on our list, is just um, obviously, unfortunately, we couldn't see you on the screen in the opening and closing ceremonies. And I just wondered what happened back at the Australian camp when, when those ceremonies were on. What did you get up to? Who wants to jump in there? Yeah, Who hasn't jump spoken? In. Jenny. Um, yeah, so opening, it was really nice. So for both opening and closing, um, what people don't understand with opening and closing, so what opening starts at 8 p.m., Australia probably doesn't march out to 9, 9.30. If you're attending the opening, you don't leave and um, you leave at like 4 p.m. So you're. it's not just a quick go to the opening March. So even we didn't go because as an Australian team, we made a commitment to stay COVID, free, um, COVID safe and COVID free, but we probably wouldn't have gone anyway because we had a game the next day. And that's, it, it takes hours to do an opening and you're just standing around. So for both opening and closing as a whole entire Australian Paralympic team, we sent off our flag bearers. So around four-ish, we sent off our flag bearers. Then we could relax and have dinner for opening. And then we all just came back and, um, Bryce was talking about we could sit outside and there was big screens. So we all just sat outside and watched the opening back in the village. Um, for closing, obviously, we could let our hair down a little bit more than the opening. Um, Pete said there was karaoke. I think we had a few lemonades and just partied a little bit with the team. Awesome. Uh, there is actually a question in the chat. Who was the best singer? Oh, Jenny by far. I was going to say not Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jen. She's the know. best leader yeah. of singers. I'm a very good singer. You are a good singer. You put some good old school songs, and Mika doesn't get shy. She's up there singing along. So I think Mika's up there too. <laughs> Great. I think um, we've probably chatted on and, and had too much airtime at the moment, us being BSA. I know there's a few questions. Um, backing up on the chat so maybe I'll just get through these couple of questions and then um, I think um, if you have a question you want to ask this is to the audience please um, if you can unmute your mic and ask the question and that might be nice too so I think there's three or four questions I'll just take them in order so this one's from Melissa Martin she was just um, reflecting on that discussion we had about the trials and tribulations of training during COVID and she's asked a question about how long were you all together before you headed off to Tokyo <clears throat> I think we had, uh, was it five days, four days, four or five days in Melbourne. And prior to that, the last time we were together was about two months before that. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, so yeah, it was, it was a very short turnaround time um, considering we hadn't played much together. Well, obviously we had played a lot together, but to not have played together recently to get into camp and then leave straight for Tokyo and pretty much go straight into competition. It was a very quick turnaround. Uh, but yeah, it was about four or five days before we headed over. Great. Not long at all. It's just, it's amazing what, what you guys managed to pull together. Incredible. And I think that answers one is we, we had five days there as well. So it was four days in Melbourne, five days, in Tokyo before we had to play. Okay, so and, nine, and that sounds nine like days. a lot, but that's one training session a, uh, a day um, while we we're in Tokyo. And the Essendon hub was really fantastic. But for those who don't know, these girls made an absolute commitment to become individually better. Then I guess the risk we took was to, in, in bringing that um, individual stuff together. Um, so in answer to one of the other questions, which was asked about how do we get over the game in Israel, um, that was our first international game for um, over two years. And we left our last international game on a semi high because we'd qualified for the Paralympics nearly 18 months out, but hadn't had a chance to, to really rejoice that. I won't go into the details. Um, but we made a commitment to, to park it and get on with the next one. And I mean, if you really have a look at the, the Chinese game, you can look at the score line and measure it that way. But we felt that we committed to being defensively better. And that was the commitment all along. So um, one of the 
the questions asked was how, how can we learn from this experience? Um, as a coach, I would say, learn that defense wins matches at this end. If you can stop goals, it takes the pressure off uh, your throwing. If you let goals in, you, there's lots of pressure. So get individually better at, at the skills of defense. It sounds really boring, um, but it's really important for any young goal baller coming up. Thanks, Pete. And there is a couple of questions on the chat, um, you know, specifically related to goal ball. One is from Andrew Perry. What is one piece of advice you would give to any new or existing goal ball players out of this experience? And I suppose you've said, we'll work on your defence <laughs> is one. Um, I'll answer um, that. Um, I think one thing I would say as a, like for a young person is um, playing goal ball in Australia is tough. You know, we don't get a lot of support. Um, you, you're not there for the money. Um, you got to give up a lot. You got to sacrifice time with your family. You've got to sacrifice work, everything. Um, you need to learn to play with your heart. Um, and that's the biggest advice, you know, you're not, there's a lot of things you're not going to gain from goal ball, but if you love it um, and you play with your heart, you can do anything. Um, and then another piece of advice, especially out of this campaign, I would say is um, you need to do everything for the team. You know, you might have an issue. Um, I don't know. Let's just say you, you don't always get along with say one player, but you know, I think, a piece of advice is just you have to park that and you have to get over it for the good of the team. You know, you're you're not above the team. So that's another piece of advice I would give. Great advice. My advice is, and I think this came through with this campaign because we had because we we didn't have as much time to, I guess more, not as much gameplay before Tokyo. Um, the importance when you're training it is more important to drill and perfect technique than try and get this perfect game situation. Um, one thing I noticed in Tokyo, the way I defend in a game is actually so different from how I train. But the difference is in training, I'm trying to perfect those little one percenters, you know, have your hand in a perfect position, have your hips in a perfect position. In a game, it, I don't, it doesn't matter how you block the ball, you just want to be in front of the ball, but you can't be in front of the ball if you don't do those drills and skills in training. So, and I think in, in some areas of Australia, people put too much emphasis on trying to get game play in training. I think you can't, you can never replicate that international experience perfectly, especially when you don't have your other Australian teammates. So your training should be almost all drills and skills and perfect that technique. That's so important. Don't throw that out the window. I, I think as well, sorry, just quickly going off um, both what Mika and Jenny said is I think, you know, Mika's right. Uh, global in Australia is tough. We, we have it tough if you compare the opportunities we have compared to other countries. Um, but I think as well within our states and within the people that we know, we have a lot of resources. And I think that um, you know, uh, someone once told me, when I first started goalball, someone once told me, everything you learn, suck it up like a sponge. So even if it's one person telling you, you know, maybe you should try this or maybe you should do that, just take a second to, to listen to them, give it a go, and then it's up to you with how you do it. Because Jenny's right, there is really no right or wrong way to do something as such, you know, so minute. Um, but, but, but give things a go. Um, you know, if, if you watch the way us girls, we play, we all play so differently. Mika throws a bounce ball completely different to how Brody does, but they both effectively throw bounce balls. Um, so I think, you know, you look at, you know, Jenny's, um, you know, Jenny's similar with Rice, they're both predominantly solid defenders, but yet they defend quite differently. So I think, you know, in my experience and what I tell others is that, there's not always necessarily it's so black and white, right or wrong. It's what works with you and within your experiences and within, you know, what you're prepared to give. Um, you know, like like Mika said, it doesn't come easy. You have to be prepared to, to sacrifice stuff and to give stuff if you want to get to that level because it doesn't come on a silver platter because, you know, it, what's, the, what's the fun in that? It's got to be fun. You've got to, your heart's got to be in it. You've got to want to chase it because no one can chase it for you. Yeah, well said.
Thanks, girls. I'm, I'm going to add to that that the Paralympic Games now, people will, I think are starting to realise, is that the absolute pinnacle of the sport. So there should be no free passes. If you work really, really hard and there's enough resources in Australia and there are enough fantastic players, both male and female, who can help you if you reach out and commit. But that's at the elite level. If you want to get to a Paralympic Games, um, there is a fantastic opportunity in the next um, three cycles with uh, Paris only three years away, um, America after that, and now, then Brisbane. There is a, but it's going to take, for some of the younger athletes, it's going to take all of those cycles to get themselves that opportunity. And if they think they're just, we can just wait around for Brisbane and four years before get it all right, it won't happen that way. Um, do the work now and you'll get the rewards because it, Tian's right. It's what you put in. It's not what you get out of it. That's um that's a really good point, Pete, and it and it actually leads into a question that um has been asked on the chat here by Katie Spencer, and the question was to everyone, and it is, what is the reason that you did goalball? What was the reason you took it up in the first place? So that's probably something to reflect on too. Oh, I'll go first. Um, I originally didn't take goalball up for the opportunity uh, to play sport. I took global up because I heard that if I got decent at it, I could travel the world with it. And that was very enticing to me as a 14, 15 year old hearing that, oh, if I can get good at this sport, then I might have the opportunity to travel and see the world. Um, and so that, that definitely kind of sparked a fire in me to be like, okay, all right, let's go. I begged my parents to take me to the next session. And um, I put in the hard work at home, uh, Simo threw balls at me a lot and uh, got frustrated with me a lot and I got frustrated with him a lot, but um, it was a process and, um, uh, and I, I did get to travel, which has been really exciting and really rewarding, um, but now I, while the travel is great, I don't play for the travel, I play because I love the sport, I play because I love this team and I play because um, it's given me a community I didn't know I needed. Thanks, Brody. That's a terrific reflection. Do any does anyone else have anything they want to add there on why they took up the sport? Yeah, um, I I've never been able to play team sports. I can't catch. I I just don't have the vision. And uh, for the longest time, I wanted to be a part of a team. I just from individual sport, it's just not the same. So. I love that goalball is completely equal. You put your eye shades on and everyone's blind. And I, I think that that is the only, like, that's the biggest draw card for me. So I can play a really fun team sport. And it's really physical. It's demanding on the body and, it, and, and you get to work with people. And I just think that that's the, you can't replace that. That's why I love goalball. Um, and I'll always love goalball for that reason, because I finally felt equal and able to be in a team. So yeah, that's amazing. Awesome. Um, I I started through school. Um, I just got into it luckily through school, and but I continued to play um, mostly like Rice said because um, you did feel equal. It's the only team sport, I suppose, for a vision and for a vision impaired person where it is equal. Equal, um, but I continued to play because of the community, because um, the friendships that it made me. Everyone like well especially in Queensland because that's where we are predominantly played um but they're just so welcoming and um that I suppose they're family now you know they've stuck by you through a lot of things in life and um yeah it's a great community and I'm very thankful for it Thanks. Thanks, Mika. Um, there's another question on the chat. We might just zoom through a few because I'm conscious that um, we've been going for a little while now. So moving on from goalball, someone's asked a question of what else do you do sport that's sport-wise apart from goalball? And I guess that's pointing to other hobbies or other sports you might be involved in, should you have any time, I guess. And also what sports are you interested in doing next? Yeah. Or, or in complimentary? Um. I, I rock climb in my spare time, uh, do a couple of sessions a week um, and I've had to back off before Tokyo just to be safe. Um, so I'm really keen to try and figure that out and do more rock climbing. So if that ever 
like not I love goalball but you know individually I'd love to see what I could do with para climbing I know that that's an in, it's an in its infancy so I'm just, I, it's pretty silly because I'm colorblind so I make it really hard for myself but uh, that's what I do and, and other than that I go hiking so yeah that's it's my other sport awesome. <laughs> I um I play netball so very 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 social netball um so I played as a kid and I played a season yeah same with rice I played earlier this year but then had to stop the season for Tokyo but I want to get back onto into social netball our team is that bad that I get put in center and I can't like I can throw and catch just but that's how bad our team is when you put the blind person in the middle um otherwise I've been took up running in COVID so I'd like to go back to running and get into trail running a bit maybe yeah awesome for me it's kayaking I enjoy uh, going for a good kayak down the river um other than that I don't really do any other sports except goal but yeah Half marathon running has become very really popular. Spur of the moment decisions, yeah, definitely. I mostly just play goalball, but um, prior to leaving to London, I oh sorry, London, Tokyo, <laughs> I started playing blind tennis. Um, not to get good at it, but just to have something to do when I retire from goalball. So I have um, keep fit and um, can join like another community and make new friends and just, yeah, continue to stay fit. So see where that goes. <laughs> that's awesome. And I think that's, I think that's important part about um, that sport, certainly from, from my perspective in terms of what we, we, from a blind sports Australia broader perspective, it's sometimes sports about uh, elite level but, but so often sports about and, and I think you've all alluded to in some point sports very much around what it gives you in terms of connection with other people and enjoyment or, or getting out and doing stuff so uh, it's it's wonderful to hear some of the different sports that that people are involved in um, because as I said sports about a lot of the time is about taking part we chasing your, your goals to elite level is something that many people don't do, it, it, but um, or they that's part of what they do. And there's other sports that they play along the way. So it's really interesting to hear that. Sure is, it sure is. Um, there's a couple more questions here. So the first one's from Jess Clark to everybody. And um, she was wants to know how it feels to be part of the best Aussie goalball team in years. I'm going to be brave and say, can we say we're the best? Well, we've had the best result ever. So not even in years. We might not be the best ever, but we have had the best result ever of an Australian women's goalball team. So I'm just going to correct that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, it's incredible. We're, everyone's such incredible athletes, incredible people off court. And, you know, we've talked about how we've supported each other off court. Um it's such a good feeling and it's been a long time coming for some of us. We've worked very, very, very hard. Yeah, not just the last five years, but well over 10 years for some of us. It's been a long time coming. So it's a relief that we finally got some results. Can I add to that, Jen? Um, it's one thing to look at the result and the result speak for itself, but you're talking about a women's sport who's gone from... Um, to elite level, the, the women's game of goalball and the game of goalball, I think it's potentially come of age, but the improvement in the women's side of that game has been enormous over the last 12 years. So not only have we got our best result, we've got our best result when the sport is at its best and getting better. So um, it sort of doubles down. Not only are we competitive, we are twice as competitive because the competition's twice as good. I think as well, um, for me, it, you know, it's an incredible thing to be a part of, you know, we, we've made history, but for me as well, I, I have to take, I have to thank all the people before me. I, I really honestly do. Um, you know, the question before is how did you start goalball? Well, I was that 10 year old kid in the crowd at Sydney 2000 Paralympics that saw goalball for the first time. And I was like, I want to do this because those people are incredible. And if it wasn't for those people, I wouldn't be where I am now. 
And so it's amazing to, you know, we felt so much love back here in Australia and, you know, and you can't take that experience away. But, but a lot of me is like, I have to thank all the people before me because, you know, if, if it wasn't for them, none of us would be here. And I just, I just have to thank, thank them and, you know, thank, thank the people. And, you know, I think as well, people like, you know, Blind Sports Australia who pick us up and, you know, give us resources and help, help us, um, you know, in, in this environment to be able to get the best results we can, you know, people, all those people, our coaches and everyone, you know, I think a lot of that for me is giving back to a lot of people who, who have put in that time and that sacrifice to try and get to this point. And unfortunately they may have not got it, but our win is for them as well. That That's just for me, but. Well said, Tian. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, Tian. I guess we'll have to probably call an end to questions yep. and I'll just wrap up the last couple that are on the chat and they um, are back talking about um, the games that you played. And there was a question about how the team viewed your progress from um, the beginning to the end, you know, how you viewed that as a team um, and how, you know, you improved individually. Start with that. Um, these girls learned to play in the moment. So um, playing without regrets and playing without fear and playing without nerves and, and just being in the moment is a skill in itself. So these girls learned how to do that. So if you take anything from this group of fantastic athletes understand that one listening and two playing in the moment is a skill you have to learn. Um, two with, in answer, and I'm now going to talk as a really proud coach. Um, people outside the thing will say, will look will add up penalties or scores or whatever. The fact is, Turkey scored the first goal against us, and we we scored back at them. Right, so we put it, the, the scores then nil all. They then dominated us for a few minutes and we didn't quit. And you can add up the penalties, but the moment a penalty is taken, if it goes in, the game changes. If it misses, the game changes and you have to fight some more. That's right. Um, we're probably just at the end now and there's a, there's a question on here about um, what's next for everybody, which is probably a nice way to wrap up and finish. Um, maybe if each of you can make a comment on what your plans are of what happens next when you get out of uh, quarantine? What's what's happening for you? Well, I personally, um, this year's a big year enough already, um, Paralympics aside, um, I'm hopefully going to graduate with my uni degree after after I get out of quarantine. I've got a, some more uni to do, but um, then following that, um, getting out into the workforce and definitely uh, gearing up towards 2024 because competing at this tournament again after not competing for almost two years, it's reminded me of why I played and, um, and how much I love the sport and the sport and um, the, this community. And so I'm definitely excited to, to see what the Aussie Bells can do going forward in the future. Uh, anybody else want to add anything there? Me? Uh, well, I'm, as people are probably aware, I won't be in Paris in 2024. So I'm just going to take up hobbies that I haven't had time for, um, spend time with my partner who I haven't had time for, um, do all the things that I've had to go, no, nah, goal ball, goal ball, goal ball. So all the things that I haven't had time for when lockdowns end. <laughs> Um, first thing I'm going to do is breathe in some fresh air, uh, <laughs> totally missing that. Um, but I, like Jenny, will not be going to Paris. Um, well, not going for goalball. Um, I am retiring like Jenny. I want to do the things that I haven't had time for, um, go home and spend time with the family. Um, uh, it's my niece's first birthday today and Again, I'm not there and I've missed so many birthdays. I have 10 nieces and nephews and I've missed births. I've missed birthdays. I've, I've given up a lot. Um, I've been playing for 17 years on uh, for Australia. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to go live my life. Um, happy to help the team whenever they need it. Um, 
in any way that I can because my heart will always be in goalball and with this team. Um, but yeah, ready to just go live my life and have some fun. Awesome. Um, I'm just going to take everything one step at a time. I do intend to keep playing. So that's that's where I'm at right now. And whatever that looks like, I'm, I'm, I know that I will rise to the challenge. So whatever the training looks like. And I know that no matter what, we're going to have that support from everyone, regardless of whether they're still playing or not. Um, and the rest of Australia will have that support behind us. And like, I, I know myself personally, that's something that will keep me going. So I definitely, um, I am half French. Uh, so I feel like I have to, I have to be in Paris in <laughs> one way, shape or form. So um, yeah, I've got to uh, get better with my French again. So no, that's where I'm at right now. But um, so just take it at one step at a time at, at this point. Yeah, I guess mine's keep training, keep building, keep loving global. Um, in terms of the rest of my life, keep chipping away at uni. And over the next couple of months, with HSC pushed back, I'm an acad academic tutor. So that'll keep me busy for a while. Um, yeah, no big plans, just keep living life. Awesome. Yeah, I think... Um... I don't really have a job, so I have to get one of those because adulting requires jobs these days. Um, but, yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I don't really have anything set in stone as to what, what I'm going to do, but, you know, I think, um, I think there's, you know, everyone has hobbies and stuff. I don't, I don't really know what my hobbies are apart from goalball. Um, so I, yeah, I'd like to explore that. I'd like to explore other hobbies and, you know, I think I'm like to get out of Sydney, bit of a, bit of a change. I think it's, it's time for something new. And in terms of goal ball, you know, I guess we'll see what happens there. I haven't really completely decided, but, um, yeah, just sort out some hobbies. What else do you do in lockdown? <laughs> well said, Tian. That's exactly right. That, that's pretty much about it. I'm going to hug lots of people when I get out of this place. From 1.5 metres, of course. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just with the mask on. Fair enough. And Simon, what do you do once, once you're out of quarantine, mate? Yeah, but well, I've already started back at work in quarantine. So, yeah, just back to work. Just the usual. Good work. Can I finish by thanking all of you who have joined us for today's session? In particular, I know there are many friends and family of the Bells team who are with us today. I know how much you have supported and given to enable this team to get to this point, including spending time apart from them as a result of COVID, travel, competition, preparation, etc. Thank you to members of the BSA board who have joined today's event, along with members of Goalball Australia and state-based Goalball associations, and I can see many of you on the call today. Finally, a big thank you to Peter, Simon and the Bells players for taking the time with us this afternoon, particularly as you work through your quarantine periods, which can't be easy. We look forward to spending some time with you in person in the not too distant future to acknowledge what you've done so far and continue, continuing your roles as BSA ambassadors. Please continue to support this amazing sport and the many different blind sports that are on offer in Australia. And don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions. Thank you and good afternoon.